People of the Universe, I'm Matt Micucci and this is Matt's Art Chat, my weekly series of podcast conversations about the arts with creators, curators, and art lovers from all over the world. People of the Universe, welcome to a brand new episode of Matt's Art Chat, my weekly series of podcast conversations about the arts with creators, curators, and art lovers from all over the world. I'm Matt Mikucci, and in this episode, I will be speaking with director Kemal Yildirim about his new film, Wasteland, which blends horror and surrealism and is inspired by personal events. And the conversation touches on the challenges of being an independent filmmaker as well, which of course is a challenging thing for several reasons, but on the other hand, may allow film auteurs to emerge and voice their own creativity in an idiosyncratic way. And since this week's conversation is mainly, but not exclusively, about cinema, let me do something that I surprisingly never do. Plug my own collection of writings on film Eye of the Beholder, which is available on Amazon in a popular ebook format. I'm looking to have a paperback version of the book available soon, but I just can't seem to be able to find the time to format the cover for the paperback version. Anyways, again, that's Eye of the Beholder, out now on Amazon. But for now, here's my chat with Kemal Yildirim. Fire up an audio teeny, sit back, relax, and listen to the audio waves as they fly through the air. Hi, Kamal. How are you? I'm well, Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. So, uh, where are you speaking from right now? I am slap bang in the middle of England uh, in a little town called Northampton. All right. So, this is the first time we speak. So uh, what I like to find out in these podcast conversations is just, uh, you know, I'd I'd like to find out a bit about the journey of the person I'm speaking with. And uh, specifically now, we're going to be talking a lot about films. uh, So I'd like to know about your journey to becoming a filmmaker. So what's your background? Um, My background is I grew up in a little town um, in the middle of the UK, not really connected to the arts in any way, shape or form. (laughs) But um, I spent, uh, I was a very shy, retiring young child, which is very different from the way I am now. um, So as a young child, I was very shy and and film really, I, I connected with it almost instantaneously. And it kind of gave me a world in which to escape into. I, I started really just by getting a, a home movie camera for my dad. Very, very traditional story. And that kind of started this kind of passion and, and world in romance, I suppose you could call it, where I just started making my own little home movies, emulating the films I loved as a child. And it continued from there, really, until until I had one little incident that kind of made me think that I could become a professional filmmaker. And it kind of, that kind of sparked my journey going forward but film was an escape for me it was a a beautiful escape what was that little incident um it was i made a film i was i was you know like most young teens i was kind of didn't know really where i was going in life and i was making quite a lot of bad choices but at the same time i was still very much making films and into into making films and i made i made this one short film and a friend of mine saw it a friend of mine saw the film and and just said you have talent, you have something here that you should be pursuing, you should push this harder. And at that particular point, I didn't really know that I could go down the line and to become a professional filmmaker. And and it, and that little, that sparked a seed in me to kind of go and get my education sorted and, and get into film and start making films properly. So it was that one person really that, that sparked that kind of belief in me to go ahead and, and, and pursue my dreams really. So earlier, because this is the, actually the second attempt at recording this, you mentioned that, uh, you, you know, you were not happy in school as well. And that could have contributed to your, you know, wanting to become a filmmaker or escaping into film. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I grew up in the 80s and, and 90s. And as a mixed race child in those days, it was never um, 
it was sometimes a bit difficult you know there, there was a little bit of um, hardship growing up in those times you know the bullying would happen and 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 so forth it's, i'm not saying my childhood was extremely bad because it wasn't but these things kind of had a little bit of a detrimental effect on my confidence as, as a person so film was that way to kind of just escape that and because there was no judgment it was just pure pure realm of escaping into another world that someone had created and and for me it was a nice escape to escape into so what kind of films were you watching oh i watched all the classic films i mean i grew up watching all the hollywood type films with your you know your star wars and back to the future you, you know all those classic indiana jones all those real classic films but i kind of my because my mum was a real big horror fan i ended up watching a hell of a lot of horror films when i was a kid probably a lot earlier than i should have been being a dad now <laughs> i realized i was watching those films way too early but it, it kind of started this kind of seed of going you know loving horror because i'm a huge horror fan um and and kind of going down that realm but yeah i watched most of the classics that you can think of but i also because of obviously a mixed race I, i grew up watching turkish films as well so i had that embedded into me as well watching the classic turkish films as well any titles uh that you can mention the turkish films um well i mean a lot of them now are known as uh Turk exploitation trash films <laughs> <laughs> that I watched obviously the man who saved the world um you know Junaid Arkan was a big um a big influence in my childhood life because I grew up watching his films and now he's known in the west as George Arkan his name is is known in the west and he's been in a lot of what is considered B movie rip off movies of Hollywood and so I, I grew up watching those movies as a kid um but also the the kind of films that I watch Yilmaz Gune I don't know if you've heard of him as a filmmaker he won the Palme d'Or a couple of times I think as a filmmaker so his films were were a bit of an influence as a kid because he was probably the most well-known Turkish filmmaker um around at the time so he was he was a bit of an influence because I thought oh he's Turkish and he's doing well it, you know it was a bit of an inspiration for me I understand that your new film Wastelands is inspired by your personal life but Before we get into it in more detail, would you like to maybe introduce it and tell us about its story? Wastelands is an abstract film, to say the least. Um, it follows the journey of Alice, who is stuck in this in her own perpetual nightmare and compulsive behaviour. She suffers from a variety of uh, psychological conditions, and she shuts herself away and isolates herself away. And I think with what's happening around the world at the moment, it, it kind of rings true. Although we made this film before lockdown and before we had a pandemic, it kind of seems to ring true now in what's happening with, with people being isolated away. And Alice is isolating herself away um, and trying to keep her demons at bay. And then one day her father, who's suffering from a terminal illness, is thrust back in her life and she has to look after him as he's slowly edging and ebbing towards, towards his own demise. Um, and uh, unable to cope with all of this pressure that's happening around her, she calls in her her ex lover into her back into her life, um, which starts to spark a kind of psycholog psychological journey for her into discovering much more about herself. And do I understand correctly that it is inspired by the story of your mother? Yes, um, my mum lost. My mum had a very hard childhood. Uh, she was put into care when she was six years old. And she suffered, you know, the, the hardships of that. And then later on in life, she, her, her father was was murdered. So she she went through this whole traumatic process in her life. And that kind of sparked to psych, uh, her own psychological issues. So as a kid, I kind of witnessed all of this, watching my, you know, watching my mum suffer these psychological issues. And that kind of sparked a seed in me as a, as a filmmaker and as an artist to try and portray mental psychosis on on film and all of my films in some way are uh, are influenced by by mental psychosis or by mental afflictions because i because i think it's so important to us as humans to have a balanced mind and or whatever that means it's intrinsically important in in our life just just the world in general and at the moment i think mental health being in the forefront of everyone's mind at the moment so my mum's journey really influenced all that and what you know going forward the kind of films that I want to make which are quite heavy psychological dramas 
You mentioned mental psychosis, but also the struggle to find that balance. Do you struggle to find balance? Yes, I, ha I have done in life. And obviously, Wastelands is not just, it's not my my mum's journey per se, but it's influenced by that. But it's also influenced by my own journey and my own balance. I think all, all people that are into the arts suffer from some kind of journey of trying to find balance within their lives because trying to be creative in a world that's so monetized and so commercialized is quite difficult when you see what you do as an art form and what i what i see my what i'm trying to do is much more of an art form as opposed to just trying to make money i understand that needs to, you know there needs to be a kind of level playing field there and that you need to find some kind of you know monetization of of your work i understand that but it's quite difficult as an artist but in my own life, I have struggled with my own um, mental health battles and Wastelands kind of represents that. Well, yeah, what you're saying about artists kind of struggling with that, uh, obviously being an independent filmmaker definitely comes with its challenges, right? <laughs> yeah, it really does. <laughs> yeah, it really, really does. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. Um, just trying to get a film off the ground um, is very challenging for an independent filmmaker. But that's what I respect and admire about filmmakers because they have this tenacity to, because it's very hard to make a film. It's, it's extremely hard. You have to pull in a lot of resources and you have to pull in a lot of people and keep them on that same page to be able to work to one goal, to create something that everyone's proud of. And it's, it's a very encompassing position to be in so to be able to get to that point and complete a journey i think is quite a it's quite a feat for for anyone to undertake and so i admire all filmmakers that are out there making films obviously one of the major challenges is the funding part uh yeah. right? <laughs> how are you able to to find the money to finance uh wastelands well wastelands was not funded by any exterior parties it was funded by myself and a, a collaborator of mine called Mole Smith, who is best friend stroke collaborator on films. We we collaborate on each other's films. I help him, he helps me. So it, it was just an amalgamation of us putting our whatever little money we had into a pot and trying to make the best film possible. And also writing around, because obviously as an independent filmmaker, sometimes you have to write around the budget limitations that you have and be more creative. Um, and I always knew that it wasn't necessarily going to be the biggest in terms of what I had to spend in money on this film. It was much more about people's time and energy. That was going to be much more of an investment as opposed to financial money that I had to raise. So it was never going to be the biggest budget film. Um, but I think you wouldn't see, you wouldn't look, if you looked at the film, if you watched the film, you wouldn't say necessarily say it's the lowest budget film either. It kind of, I think it holds its own. With all of the challenges that that process entails, obviously there's something inside of you that makes you kind of want to do it anyways, to tell stories. It's almost yeah. like a, a desire inside of you that drives you. Definitely, definitely is. It definitely is. And I think all creatives kind of go through this when, it, you know, whether it's storytelling, music creation, you know, filmmaking, whatever it is, painting, the arts. If you don't get that out, if you don't, manage to get out that, that artistic drive and that you know that energy it, it does affect you in a lot of ways so it, it is almost like a compulsion when you're an artist that you need to you need to get this out of you you need to tell this story or you need to make this painting or whatever it might be it's not necessarily you want to or you're just doing it for the sake of it you're doing it because you have to do it and it definitely feels that way for me it definitely feels that way for me so on the other hand, I mean, being an independent filmmaker, does that also mean that you have, uh, you, you're able to tell the stories in the way that you want to tell it? I mean, you also have that type of independence? Yeah, definitely. There's definitely a certain amount of independence um, and freedom when it comes to when, when you when you are making a film, when you don't have financial struggles behind you. And I've been on both sides of the table. So I've, I've made a film where I did have financial pressures behind me. Um, so I, I, I know both sides of the coin and I do find the, the more independent route much more freeing in that sense. But at the same time, you know, the film industry, you have to be able to kind of, you know, mold and expand yourself to be able to work in any environment. And 
that's something I think filmmakers pride themselves on and being able to be um, malleable enough to work with financiers or to, to have the independent freedom to, to do what you want. But I mean, you know, it, we all want to be independently free, don't we? We all want freedom. So having that freedom is, is obviously a lot better. It's a lot better. But I've been, I've been lucky because I have worked with a lot of people that have allowed me to, to push my vision because I'm quite exacting on what I want and, 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 I have had that freedom before. So I'm, I've been quite lucky so far in my career. Hopefully it carries on that way. So just going back to Wastelands, when you talk about freedom, working within, uh, you know, the horror genre, I would say, uh, but also surrealism, does that allow you uh, poetic freedom? I think the horror genre does. It, it really, really does. I'm glad you mentioned surrealism because that was a big influence on, on the film as well. Um, and my, my particular style of surrealism is hugely important. But the horror genre itself does allow for, it's that one genre that is not stuck in one particular area. It's the kind of genre that you can expand into social realism. It's the kind of genre that you can, you can make in just a pure entertainment film. It is the kind of genre that you can really expand and bend so much more. Than, than say straight say strict drama or romantic comedy or, or you know whatever genre it might be like sci- sci-fi you know you need certain elements in sci-fi to call something sci-fi whereas horror like my film i wouldn't call it traditionally horror but it has horror-esque elements to it and that's the great thing about horror is that you can just keep expanding it and molding it and i think we've got some fantastic filmmakers out there now that are making some really beautiful horror films that are expanding it people like jordan peele ari Aster, you know people like this that are that are bending and flexing the horror genre to a massive degree that it's it's now becoming much more than what it was seen as earlier on in in its you know creation where it's just a hokey genre now it's considered much you know i think it's much more cons- considered and um, respected i think the horror genre is yeah, I think when you talk about uh, horror sort of being less respected than other genres, uh, there have been plenty of scholars sort of who have written their thoughts about it. But I think that looking back to it, it in cinema, it's true more than in other art forms because something uh, horror imagery in, in art such as painting or sculpture would have been celebrated, uh, even defined more as surrealistic. So it's very interesting to kind of note that. I think a lot of people have also said that um, part of the reason why horror was sort of looked down uh, to is that um, but it evokes a bodily reaction from the audience, much like comedy, which is why horror and comedy have sort of been put in the same bracket of films that are not as easily celebrated as others. Absolutely, yeah, I think you're absolutely you're absolutely right on that on that score because it is it is a, it is a, you, mu- you get much more of a knee jerk reaction to horror as opposed to any other genre and comedy. So you're absolutely right, and I think you know going forward, I can see great things for the horror genre to keep expanding and to keep you know and to get to the point where it's just as well respected as say you know if we if we you know take the Hollywood genre for example or the or the the Cannes Film Festival, for example, I think horror will get to that point where it's so much more well-respected, even in those kind of pinnacles of what people aspire to do. So I can only see it getting better. I can only see it getting better. We'll return to my conversation with Kemal Yildirim momentarily. But first... I wanted to remind you that you can listen to more Matt's Art Chat podcasts by simply searching Matt's Art Chat on several media platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, Podbean, Mixcloud, and so on, as well as my own personal website, inartemat.com. That's I-N-A-R-T-E-M-A-T-T dot com. There, you will be able to find more conversations about the arts with creators, curators, and art lovers from all over the world, including a chat with photographer Al Lapkowski, who specializes in social awareness photography. Like in photography, there's uh, uh, documentary photographers who will travel to hotspots in the world, like go to Afghanistan or Iraq, to India, and take pictures of starving kids, for example. 
I don't want to do it, but I, 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 I feel that what we're talking about is very important and I'm trying to talk about same subjects, but by using artistic photography. You can listen to the full interview with Al Lapkowski and more conversations about the arts with creators, curators and art lovers from all over the world by searching Matt's Art Chat on YouTube, Spotify, Podbean, Mixcloud and several other media streaming platforms. And again, you'll be able to find them all on my own website, inartemat.com, that's I-N-A-R-T-E-M-A-T-T dot com as well. But for now... Back to my chat with filmmaker Kemal Yildirim. So traditionally speaking, uh, people have constantly made uh, the connection between surrealism and dreams. Uh, earlier we talked about how the story of Wastelands is inspired by the story of your mother, your own struggles with mental psychosis. But uh, what about dreams? I mean, do you, are you inspired by your own dreams? I wouldn't say I'm inspired by my own dreams, uh, but I'm inspired by dreams because I believe perception is a funny, a very funny thing. And my perception of the world is completely different from your perception of the world. And I think a lot of film, for example, can be seen as a dream. So I'm a little bit of a fan. I'm a fan of, say, David Lynch, for example, whose films can be categorized as just one big dream that continues. And all of his work is considered probably inside of his own head created out of a dream. So for me, dreams are a an extraordinary way to to explore human the human condition because it's not you know it's not trapped in the usual framework of the of the, the normal world of of the waking world where we have set rules and regularities that we need to stick by whereas the dream world is much more open to interpretation and that's really where my work comes in and what I want to try and do with my work that interpretation of the viewer is much more important than what I'm giving to them on screen. You know, it, it, I've, I had my own visions and ideas when I put it on screen, but their interpretation of what I've put on screen is just as important as what I've put on that screen. And I think the dream world helps to kind of allow audiences to kind of decipher film a bit more. So, you know, for example, Stanley Kubrick made Eyes Wide Shut, which may be inspired by the dream story. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Dream Story. but So if you look at Kubrick's work, you could also argue that Kubrick's work is just one big dream. And that's where I think dreams are massively important to the way that I work because they just allow so much more freedom and so much more interpretation. And really interpretation is massively important to what I do. I want people to interpret my films however they want to interpret it. You know, even if it's a hate, full reaction towards it that's also fine i don't mind anyone hating my films because it's a response it's a reaction. in other words you don't the, the one thing that you would hate for people to you know respond to the film is just feel ambivalent towards it exactly exactly that would be the biggest disservice anyone could say to me was that i just you know it was okay it was all right i forget it the next day you know it, i want people to experience my films and then you know, experience being the right word and then afterwards have some kind of reaction. If they hate it, that's absolutely fine because that means that they have an opinion on it. And if they love it, then that's fine because it means they have an opinion on it. So speaking of the look and visuals of the film, uh, which are very strong in Wastelands, are they also the work of collaboration with other artists and craftspeople? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I'm not an island unto myself, definitely not. Um, the, the cinematography was a combination of ideas and images that I had in my head and working closely with Mole Smith, who was my co co cinematographer on the film and both of us arguing with each other to try and it was definitely a collaboration between myself and Mole Smith and Leslie Evans, who um, was also my set dresser and basically, you know, sorting out all the set and sets and visual looks. And we worked closely together with the images that are in the background, which is really important to, to the story that I'm telling also. So it was definitely a collaboration between the three of us and also with my actors who are massively involved in what I do. I don't just say, I don't have a rigid set of instructions where here's a script 
what I need you to do actors is hit a mark or do this or do that. It's much more of a collaborative process. So ongoing discussions and conversations about scenes and characters, because no, apart from maybe two or three scenes in the film, no, the rest of the film wasn't scripted. It was all improvisation and improvisation is something I use in a massive way because I think improvisation creates real moments as opposed to scripted moments, which start to become staged after a while. And so naturalism is hugely important to me. So working with actors in a collaborative way is massively important. So everybody that was involved in the film is massively involved in the look of what happens in the film because they all had an input in there. But obviously, you know, as a director, you're, you're, you're the figurehead and I had a very strong vision, but everybody helped me create the film. So I definitely need to, to give them credit where it's due that we all work together to create Wastelands. So that these moments of improvisation also help the film evolve in an organic way? Absolutely. Absolutely. From the original inception of the script and the final script that I had that I presented to the actors and, and my small crew, it evolved. What, you know, I was lucky that I had two other actors in the film, two other main actors, Sean Bofer and, and Natasha Linton, who were just incredible actors and artists and completely they completely immerse themselves in the way that I work because I have a very specific way that I work and they immerse themselves in that and helped push where their characters were going and would throw me so many ideas on where we could go and how we could expand and so they were massively involved in even the, from the, the visual perspective on the way their characters would look and the way they would act and so we all very collaboratively worked together on 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 the whole process. Actors are extremely important in the films that I make. Right, right. Can you tell me more about uh, the lead actress in the film? First of all, what's her name? Her name is Natasha Linton. Okay, and, and how did you cast her and how did you work with her? The, the process of casting was, was an audious process. We, we, it was about seven months of castings we went through. We, we had originally, we had about, I think it was a thousand applications for the role. We, man, we managed to whittle it down to, you know, a hundred potential hopefuls. And then we managed to whittle it down to 25 that we were going to see. And we went through the process of seeing all these very talented actors, but I knew I always needed that extra special spark with the, with the person I was going to be, you know, casting in, in the lead role because it was going to be a very challenging working relationship we had because not only was I directing her, I was also acting opposite her as well in the film. So it was going to be a very challenging relationship. So it, we, it was whittling it down really. And when Natasha walked in, uh, I automatically said to my co co-producer Mo Smith that she was going to be uh, Alice because there was something about her automatically that she understood from an intellectual point of view what I was trying to do with the film, and that was massively important to me. And there was something very challenging about her as a person. She's a very, you know, she's a very, very dominant, strong person, and that's the kind of pe artists I like. People that are very strong-willed, very challenging. And, and also, because what I don't want to do is, because I, I can easily, with, with, with my passion and creativity, I can easily overpower somebody. And what I'm looking for in the artists that I work with are just as challenging people to challenge me, to challenge the material, to keep challenging each other so we can get the best of the material that we possibly can. And she walked in and she had all those attributes. And she kind of had the, the visual look that I wanted, and I didn't have any notion of exactly what Alice should look like. When she walked in, I almost went, that's the look that I'm looking for. She has that classic, that classic look about her from European cinema. Because I'm a huge fan of Italian cinema, actually. And Italian cinema of the 60s and 70s in particular. And she kind of had that look about her that I thought would just really bring Alice to life. And she, and she obviously did. She was phenomenal to work with. I absolutely adored working with her. And we're actually developing projects together at the moment to work together again because she just had that extra spice. She was so brave. She's such a, cause it's a very hard role for anyone to play. And she really, she really jumped at the role a hundred percent. And she also saw something in the role that she believed was grounded in reality. And that's, I think that was a big key factor 
the fact that it was grounded in, in reality. What it's about you, though? I mean, you, you're you acting in a film as well. Are you comfortable in front of the camera? Yeah, I, I actually studied. I actually started out as an actor also, so and I studied acting. So it, to me, it was... Um, also, I also teach acting sometimes as well. So it's, it's being in front of, naturally in front of the cam- camera is uh, is very normal for me. <laughs> and I am very naturally in front of the camera and acting is uh, a passion of mine as well. Why do you think you are comfortable in front of the camera? A lot of people aren't. Uh, why do you think you are? That's a really good question. Very good. I've never been asked that question before. Um, for me... Acting is a, obviously it's about disappearing into a in, into a different character, um, but also I f- I love the the vulnerability of it. Acting, especially in the kind of films that I make, it's, it's quite a vulnerable place to be, and being in that vul- vulnerable space is almost a cathartic experience. It, it allows me to exercise certain demons of my own, um, but also. I get to find out a lot more about my own inner strengths when I'm acting, I find. And being naturally in front of the camera, I think maybe because I've had a camera in my face ever since I was 15 years old um, and I'm now a lot older. So it it's just a natural part of who who I am, I suppose. I love being, I love being, I love acting. I absolutely adore acting. I think it's um, a great craft because you have to leave you have to leave your, sometimes you have to leave all those negative sides of you aside and live inside of these, you know, when I say negative sides, I mean all these doubts, and fears that we have in our own selves. You have to leave them at the door to be able to create characters. And it's, it's quite, as I said, it's a cathartic experience and I love it. Right. So, all right. So now that Wasteland is completed, what is the plan for it? Are you going to try out the film festival run? Yeah, yeah, it's actually in the. I mean, it was a bit of a late starter due to this um, pandemic, which is, you know, hurting so many people. So it had a late start to its festival run, but we are actually now off and running, and we've been accepted into ten festivals so far, won six awards so far. So we, we're doing quite well. The festival run has started well. Um, so I'm hoping it's going to continue doing well and build up some traction and so we can start getting an audience. So, yes, yeah, it's going well so far. It's going well so far. And then obviously after the festival run, we're looking to do an official release, a, a wider release. And we are currently talking to a sales agent and a distributor. So fingers crossed those talks go well. We might have a release by early next year. Speaking of the uh, frustrating times that we're living in with the pandemic and coronavirus, are you finding ways to be creative during this time? To, to be completely honest, yes. I mean, it is, it's a very struggling time. But for, for me, I've actually found it probably one of the most creative periods that I've been in. I've written numerous scripts. Um, I've used this time to, to really try and hone and, and, and try and push my creative side a lot more so you know collaborating with other artists and i think it's important now for artists even more so seeing the way that especially in the uk the way the government really has looked at the arts as a secondary importance as opposed to where it should be in my opinion which is very you know high up so artists now and collaborators need to collaborate even more so to to kind of help themselves as artists so for me i've really used that time to kind of collaborate with other artists with actors with writers and expand my network a little bit more and also try my best to to just keep as productive as i can and i've now got a plan for once we do hit the back end of this pandemic that i can hit the ground running with new projects that i've got lined up you know, it's interesting what you're saying about the state of the arts in the UK. Not too long ago, I think a lot of the art community was shocked by this poster uh, of a photo of a young yeah. dancer. I don't know if you saw it, but it was a government a- yeah, a backed advert suggesting that a dancer should just retrain and uh, really get into cyber, <laughs> cyber security or something. Very, very weird. <laughs> why do you think that is? Why, why do you think this is happening in the UK now? It hasn't really always been like this, I don't feel. No, I don't. I don't feel, and obviously, I don't. I, I really don't want to sit here bashing political, you know, a political drum. But it, for me, 
<laughs> for me, it's again, it goes down to the commercialism and fundamental part of political society where the arts is always seen as a secondary, as a kind of, you know, as a, a fluffy industry to be in without realizing that billions, absolute billions are generated yearly from the arts. And the arts is a massively diverse sector of, of, of our community and of our, of our society. So, so to, in order to, to, to ask them to retrain, to potentially retrain and, and find a different kind of employment, is completely infuriating and also fundamentally wrong because the arts has been around for as long as man. Um, so in order, you know, for, for any party to say that is, is really, really bad. But I do find that, you know, increasingly we are going much more towards a, just a, a corporation led world as opposed to, you know, a, a world where people come first as opposed to, financial matters and i re i realize you know it has to be a balance finance is important for a society to survive but people's well-being and happiness is equally as important to that and, and i i can't really answer the question why it keeps happening but it needs to stop happening because the arts are intrinsically important to our society earlier i believe you mentioned that you are also a father is that right i am indeed yes i am father of three Oh, okay, so uh, this is something that I've sort of been asking people who are, who are also parents because of the challenging nature of the, any career in the arts. We talked about balance earlier. Do you find that it's, it's yes. a challenge to balance family life and the art life? I, absolutely. It is, a, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. It's all, it will always be a challenge. Because parenthood obviously is a massively you know, encompassing scenario. Um, but for me, obviously, the, for me, I see it's all linked. And and being a parent, it changed me as, as an artist. But in, in many respects, it made me a better artist. Because obviously, when you're a young artist, and you're there in the industry, trying your best to, to, you know, make it and you're hungry, and you know, you're, you're led by ego, it, you only really see self. Whereas when you've got little ones that are dependent on you, you start to see the world in a different way. And you st I start to, to see that the films that I'm making in some way I'm hoping will be a legacy for my children in some respect that, you know, maybe it's a way for them to know their dad a bit more. So, so for, for me, it's, it, it, I think it's, it, it's such a cool thing to be a dad and I'm lucky to have three beautiful children, um, healthy, beautiful children. And, um, so it's always, it's, it's always been a much, easier thing now that I've got kids to be an artist and I know that's a lot of artists don't say that because it is a juggle you have to juggle your creative side and your family life but if you can try and see it as a part of the same journey it makes it a little bit easier all right Kamal it's been an absolute pleasure thank you thank you it's been a pleasure talking to you too Matt I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me hope you enjoyed that one folks don't forget that you can listen to more conversations about the arts with creators, curators, and art lovers from all over the world by searching Matt's Art Chat on YouTube, Spotify, Podbean, Mixcloud, and other streaming platforms. But you'll also be able to find them all at my own website, inartemat.com. That's I-N-A-R-T-E-M-A-T-T.com. We'll see you next week for more conversations about the arts. But for now, stay healthy, stay safe. Stay strong, and I wish you well in your artistic ventures. <laughs> <laughs>